the Dempster Highway was just such an enchanting otherworldly experience. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, we had days where it was like raining and heavy fog. You couldn't see a thing. And then we had days that were like sunny and the 60s and you had the tundra and then you had um, like just these mossy green hills and mountains. Caribou and running everywhere. Caribou running yeah. everywhere and bears. And yeah. it was just, I mean... It was just amazing. It, it um, was just, I, I can't, Mike, I can't believe that. I really want to go back. Yeah. Honestly, I want to do it again. Yeah, it was so cool. I want to do it again. Welcome back, everyone, to the Out and Back podcast presented by Gaia GPS. I'm your host, Shanti, and that was Kevin and Sarah McHouston, who were known on the internet as Lifestyle Overland. The McHoustons ditched the 9 to 5 and hit the road in their Toyota 4Runner, which they nicknamed Silver. Living full-time out of Silver and their turtleback trailer, Kevin and Sarah, along with their young daughter Caroline, sought out the back roads and off-road adventures all over North America. In this episode, Kevin and Sarah are going to take us through their transition from conventional life to full-blown overlanding. They talk about the nearly 800-mile Enchanted Rockies Trail they created in the beginning of their overlanding career, and their northern trip through Canada and Alaska and north beyond the Arctic Circle. Of course, like any good overlander, the McCusins are also going to dive into the details of their rig, explaining why they chose a Toyota 4Runner instead of the vehicle they thought they wanted. Sarah gives her tips for traveling long distance with a toddler, and Kevin talks about their favorite meal out on the road. Together, they explain how to break into the sport of overlanding. But first, before we get started with them, before you go out on your own adventure, whether it's off-roading, backpacking, day hiking, or simply camping, you'll need the best backcountry navigation app to help you find your way. And right now, Gaia GPS is offering up to a 50% discount on memberships to podcast listeners. Visit GaiaGPS.com slash podcast. That's G-A-I-A GPS.com slash podcast to get up to a 50% discount on membership options. Don't miss this special deal so you can access all the best backcountry maps, including National Geographic Trails Illustrated, USGS Topo Maps, satellite imagery, weather forecasting layers, and so much more. In our talk, Kevin and Sarah are going to explain how useful the Gaia GPS app has been in planning their trips and in creating custom routes. So without further ado, let's shift gear and dive right in. Well, hello, Kevin and Sarah. Thanks for joining us on the Out and Back podcast. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Glad to be here. So quick recap of your background. So you two, as well as your daughter, Caroline, you are full-time adventurers, as well as full-time YouTubers who are overlanding all across North America. Um, you have over 150,000 subscribers on your YouTube channel, Lifestyle Overland, right? That's yep. correct. Mm-hmm. Over 75,000 followers on your Instagram page. You have millions of views. And you just launched a new podcast series earlier this year, right? We did. We did. We're calling it Campfire Confessions, and it's just a chance for Sarah and I to sit down and have <laughs> intimate conversations about <laughs> our backgrounds Actually and perspectives catch up over and the week. <laughs> things like that. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess we could say you've really been living the dream that I think a lot of people have, this ability to pursue what you want and make it work. Yeah. it's uh, It's been quite the adventure. And I would say that definitely from the outside looking in, it it does appear to be a dream and not to knock it. I mean, it absolutely is enjoyable. I'm passionate about every single thing that we do, but it's more than nine to five. It's more five five to nine. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) But uh, it's the most rewarding job that we've ever had. And, you know, it's like they say, if you if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. And um, that's really not true, but (laughs) it's kind of there. (laughs) Yeah. Every day is going to have its challenges. You Absolutely. Know, the thing you love the most, but That's it's it. so cool. It's so cool. So the way I want to start out this podcast is by learning how you two, along with Caroline, were able to transition from your quote unquote normal everyday life to being lifestyle overland. So for starters, what was your life like before becoming lifestyle overland? Your story starts in uh, Tennessee, right? Uh, well, it was it was your typical um, American pursuit of the American dream kind of thing. Um, you know, I started out working for myself when I was about 14 years old, mowing yards and stuff like that, and got into construction with my dad and quickly got into 
uh, the industrial side of the of the electrical trade, and kind of came up from there. And you know, Sarah and I met um, at a summer camp, and you know, we have very similar hopes and dreams of mm-hmm. raising a family and stuff. And so we kind of synced up at that point, and just settled into this everyday life. You know, I was working as a, uh, as a project manager for electrical company and I she was, was still, college. yeah, she was still, she's much younger than me. So she was wrapping, <laughs> up, <laughs> wrapping up her degree, um, at college at this point. So we had, you know, we had the house, we had the dog, we had the, the plans to eventually have kids and live in paycheck to paycheck. But you know, but we, we were happy. We were ish. We were happy ish. <laughs> so then, how and when did you get into uh, overlanding? Uh, you know, really, I grew up on a farm, and Sarah did too, and mm-hmm. so we we'd always love getting out in the mud with the tractors and the trucks from time to time. But you know, never at, at that point in time, we weren't really deep into what I would call overlanding. You know, we went camping yeah, we just three or four like, times like a year. Yeah, just camping in the summer um, or something like that. Hiking three or four times a year. We loved the outdoors, but it wasn't intentional. You know, it was just sort of um, something that we do on occasion. It wasn't until we got into, the, until we moved to New Mexico for, mm-hmm. for a job opportunity. And um, we were out here and looking around at all this incredible landscape and public lands that were just kind of at our fingertips. And, but we uh, were also kind of looking for just something to do. You know, we had gone from East Tennessee where all where we were born and raised, like all of our family and friends were there and then transplanted to New Mexico where we knew absolutely no one. And we're like, what do you guys do in the middle of nowhere? Like (laughs) you don't have the nice restaurants, you don't have the shopping. So what do you guys do? So I think at the time we were definitely open to new ideas and different things to try. Yeah, and the the thing is, is here in southeast New Mexico, it's it's very much flatland. There's there's not, you know, hiking trails or you know mountains or anything like that. We're about two and a half hours away from the nearest what I, what I would call mountain range. mountain mountain area. Yeah, and so um, a f- a friend that we had made um, probably in the first year or so that we mm-hmm. were in New Mexico, he invited me to go with him um, and a few buddies up to the mountains and do what he calls wheeling. And I'm like, what's wheeling? <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, four by four, you know, off road. Oh, okay, yeah. So um, I hardly knew this guy, and so I took off with him. And he had a Jeep um, XJ, a Jeep Cherokee that he had built out, and I think he had 37s on it. And got up there, and I mean, within just a few hours, it was it was my mind was blown. I mean, I had never seen New Mexico from that perspective. We were in places that was, you know, oh, they're so beautiful. Way back in there, mm-hmm. you, you would just never see anyone for days, and uh, that whole concept was just was just awesome. Now, granted, he trailered it up there. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't tying into the camping aspect at that time, but it really opened my eyes to, oh wow, there's a lot of stuff right here in New Mexico to explore. And that's kind of where the bug started with me. Yeah. Is there, you, you mentioned, uh, your friend mentioned wheeling. Um, is that the same thing as overlanding? Because I know there's a bunch, there's like wheeling, there's crawling, there's overlanding. Like what, is there a difference between those three terms or are they all the same? I. It all depends on who you ask. <laughs> that's it. There's There's a wide range of perspectives on what overlanding truly means. You've got... You've got a crowd that says it's not overlanding unless you're crossing international borders yeah, and, that's true. and your home is in your vehicle. And then mm-hmm. you've got people who say, well, overlanding is vehicle supported travel. So if you're going to go out for a weekend and live out of your vehicle, that's overlanding. Um, well, honestly, we don't care what you call it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because uh, we, we feel that a lot of people waste a lot of energy arguing about the terminology when they could just be outside having the next fun. adventure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Focusing on the important things. That's right. it. That's it. <clears throat> Does it have anything to do with uh, the difficulty of the terrain? Like, um, is it, if it's overlanding, if like you're going down primarily dirt roads, or do you have to be like rock crawling at a certain point? I, I think that for for us in particular, overlanding is more um, long distance travel. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. There's not this pursuit of challenges. You know, your your goal is to maintain the integrity of your vehicle while having a good time. Um, and that means from time to time, yeah, you're going to go and find technical Trails. challenges just to spice things up a bit. But um, wheeling or rock crawling is really the pursuit of that obstacle. 
and the bragging rights of, yeah, I got, I my got over it. Yeah. Got over that without breaking <laughs> another drive shaft, you yeah. know, and, um, the wheeling crowd definitely, you know, has a, <laughs> uh, a higher tendency to break parts because they are always pushing the edge of the vehicle. Mm -hmm. Whereas overlanding is really the marathon runner of, of off-roading. It's really about going as far as you possibly can and having everything that you need to self-sustain and self-recover and repair and stuff like that. So when your friend was first taking you out and you first got this exposure to the overlanding world and how amazing it was and what you could see, um, did you then have to uh, get yourself a brand new set of gear, uh, a new vehicle or anything, or did you have a basic setup to make it work at the beginning? Well, we we went through quite a transition when it comes to that because we have always, always loved the uh, classic Land Cruisers. Mm -hmm. And I'm definitely, at the time, I was definitely a Craigslist addict. <laughs> so he was that, always shopping. That was, that I was, got so many emails. Yeah. Every, every morning with coffee and every bathroom break, I was checking Sarah, up. Sarah, look at this. <laughs> Sarah, look at this one. And, uh, one day, you know, this was kind of in the heat of, uh, of our excitement, I stumbled across this 1980 right hand drive Land Cruiser and, uh, what was even more incredible was that it actually had a pop top. So we were like, dude, this would be yeah. amazing if the we could coolest live family out of rig. this thing, you know, camp in this thing. And um, so I, I literally, I, I sent it to, to Sarah and called her as I hit the send button. And I said, pull up your email right now. And she looks at it and she goes, oh my goodness. I said, look, this price, at this price, this vehicle is not going to last. We got it. We got to make a decision right now. And so literally within five minutes, we're like, okay, here's Just the pictures. It, yeah. Here's the things that are good about it. Things that are bad about it. Let's do this. And so I called the guy and I said, if your pictures are a true representation of this vehicle, I'll pay you what you're asking for it. If you can deliver it this weekend. And he was up in Santa Fe and we were down here in Hobbs. And, uh, he's like, uh, okay. I was like, I don't want you answering any more phone calls. You understand? Like I'm paying you this. <laughs> yeah, we like, have cash. I was like, I'll send you a deposit right now. And so, um, he was a really cool guy. turns out it was, it was a great deal. He brought it down. And matter of fact, he'd forgotten to mention a transmission leak. And so he knocked 500 off the price without even me saying anything. So it was just, it was just an awesome, um, nice, fine cool, honest us. dude. It really was. Yeah, he really, really was. was. And so, um, so yeah, we started the, the build process on that. But unfortunately, when you get into the vintage uh, world, <laughs> it's uh, you start seeing you, the you vintage. Spend, you spend more time building and fixing than you do actually getting out and adventuring. And so, what started out as a lot of motivation uh, with big dreams and big intentions. I kept seeing the good weather go by and another winter come around and yeah. I'm still working on this thing and yeah. I'm hardly seeing my kid and my wife cause I'm working a full-time job and then working in the, you know, the garage, the garage. for the whole weekend. And Sarah's well, finally and, like, yeah, well, and at the time, like Caroline was only what, seven, six, seven months yeah. old at the time. Yeah. So it was kind of one of those things where it's like, okay, well you work on it for a little while and then we'll get out there. And like he started on the engine. <laughs> so <laughs> it was quickly realizing that I was like, we're not going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah. So there, there was definitely a, a well, you know, a, a realization that this isn't going to get us on the trails the way that we originally envis envisioned as not quickly qui as we not, Yeah, not quick enough. That's And so, that's uh, you know, one day we're talking about this and we look out the window at Sarah's, she had a GMC terrain. <laughs> and I said, well... <laughs> She's like, we. I want to go camping. I want to get out and go do something. I said, well, let's go trade that thing in. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so we did. Uh huh. What did we go to, to to get though? We went. We were eyeballing and had eyeballed for a long time the FJ Cruiser. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we decided that we were going to go down. We had three picked out. We were going to test drive them, and. I quickly, very quickly realized that getting the car seat in and out of that tiny little suicide door or whatever. That little suicide side door, yeah, on the FJ. That was not going to work. Because honestly, like, <laughs> you think, oh, okay, the kid's going to be forward facing. The car seats are going to get smaller. They they don't. They stay just as big and bulky. So <laughs> I, I was like, Kevin, if you really love this vehicle, I'll make the sacrifice of this tiny little door. But if you're not 100% on it, I definitely don't want it. So um, we happened to go to this other dealership to look at a 
another FJ, assuming like <laughs> another one was going to be <laughs> any different be from the first one. <laughs> right, yeah. And the guy, so he heard me lamenting to Kev that I was like, I just don't think that this is going to work. And he's like, well, why don't you guys look at the Forerunner? And we were both like, that mom car? No, thanks. Yeah. Like, that was not going to work. And uh, so he's like, well, just give it a give it a try. See how you like it. There's this dirt pit over here that we can go and let you try out all the different settings and see how you like it. And um, you were driving first, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so I was riding in the back seat with Caroline. And uh, as we started going down the road and he turned into the dirt pit, I remember thinking, I could I could ride in this one this is all right. I can get the car seat in and out nice and easily. Yeah. And you know, this, this might work. And then at one point I remember Kevin looking up in the rear view mirror, like, do you like it? Is this, <laughs> is this going to work? And I was like, uh huh. Yeah. She's like, she leans up and whispers in my ear, let's buy it. Yeah. <laughs> so we literally the next weekend we bought it, we brought it home the next weekend we loaded up our camping stuff and headed for the hills. <laughs> and I mean, we were we putting like pinstripes the on this y'all. brand new Forerunner, just <laughs> down the sides uh, through some of these tight stock trails. Stock everything. Mexico. Totally stock. We cut a tire on the first trail. I mm-hmm. mean, it was, we were there. We, 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 we bought were that thing for a purpose. It. Yeah. And we, we started from day one. That's yeah. it. That's yeah. it. And so, yeah, that was the beginning of Silver. And uh, that was 163,000 miles ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and she's she's been all over the all over the northern uh, North America since then. So yep. So now you've taken the Forerunner out. You start big with gusto at the beginning on your first trip. It's awesome. And do you still have the uh, land the 1980 Land Cruiser? We do. He's uh he's currently resting in his uh, undisclosed <laughs> layer at this point. He's called his name's the Beast. So uh, yeah, we've been he's in hibernation. He's, he, <laughs> he's resting. We're uh it's it's a very slow build. We're we're still progressing with it because we made a commitment to each other when we bought that thing that we would never, never sell, sell it. it. Yeah. So and we've told Caroline that if she sells it after we're gone, we will haunt her. Haunt her. her. <laughs> But it's it's really, you know, become a family member at this point. And so we're just slowly, you know, saving up a bit and then taking the next step and saving up a bit and taking the next step. And we're hoping maybe in 2021 that, you know, it'll get we can some do channel some kind time. Of trip time. Yeah. But uh, it's getting it's getting there. Nice. So you have the Forerunner um, and now you've had it for a few years. You've gone on some great trips with it. Um, and this has become a hobby for you guys. So. At what point did you realize that overlanding was becoming more than a hobby and you wanted something bigger? I would have to say that um, it was kind of a two-step thing. Um, you know, we, we started out with with the Forerunner. We were going on weekend trips probably every other week. At least, yeah. And then, um, you know, kind of circling back to your, your question at the beginning of the podcast as to how we... Uh, transition to to lifestyle overland being a full time thing was that we started shifting our lifestyle uh, to more of a minimalist, and I don't really like that word. I, I think we kind of decided we liked the word intentionalist. intentionalist. <laughs> so we started looking mm-hmm. at what we were passionate about, and rather than focusing on you know the traditional house and new cars mm-hmm. and gadgets and things like that, that we wanted to like pour. We, number one, reduce our expenses, and then pour. Uh, the our heart and soul into, into yeah. the things that we're, we enjoy the most. That's when the turtle bike trailer came into being. And mm-hmm. at that point, things got so convenient, you know, having a trailer that was packed, ready to go at a moment's notice. Now we're going every weekend. And at that point I started doing some research cause I'm like, Hey, it's New Mexico is amazing. And I love these, these long weekends and stuff, but I want to do something where I, I do my own research. I link up, trails and I put together this plan and we load out the, the, the rig and the turtle back with all the proper gear and truly do what I would have say, you know, it was an overland trip where we were truly relying on that setup. And so that's where the Enchanted Rockies trail was kind of born. And I spent probably off and on probably three or four months, um, it out. mapping it out. Um, 
you know, I, w- I would lay out a map with the forest roads and then I would get in a Google Earth and really zoom in and see if there were any gates or washouts and stuff and try and develop the best plan possible before we even took off. And um, so we went on that trip, had an amazing time. And just before the trip, we grabbed a camera. <laughs> I mean, literally, we I was waffling back and forth. I was like, this is an expensive camera. Do I buy it? Do I not buy it? And finally, like two days before, thankfully, Amazon was shipping in two days back then. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah, Sarah's like, you're going to regret it if you do not record this for Caroline yeah, for at Caroline. some point in time. And so um, got the camera and recorded the trip. And I was like, all right. Several months later, I made a video so I could share it with the family. Here's what we did. And I put it on YouTube and made it public. Okay, everybody can just jump in there and see what we did. And I log back in a few days later, and it's 200 views. I'm like, who are these people? <laughs> we do not have 200 family members. <laughs> and then time goes on, put a few more episodes in there. And, and before I knew it, we were, I don't know, we were had 2,000 subscribers. And I was like, well, that's weird, you know? Like, <laughs> what what's wrong with people, you know? And so we started sharing a little bit more. And it was like, hey, I absolutely love doing this. People enjoy watching our, our story. Um with a bit of time and, and a lot of work, we finally got to the point where we said, let's go all in. I mean, we were working at Turtleback at the time. I was their operations manager. And, in Arizona. And again, I absolutely love the job, but I was working crazy, crazy hours. And I wasn't getting to go and do the things that I really enjoyed. And in the meantime, even though I hadn't posted to YouTube, the, the subscribers kept rolling in. And one day, Sarah and I were like, what are we doing? You know, like... Mm-hmm. This isn't this. This is not in line with what we had set out to do, and so uh, a good friend of ours, another YouTuber, uh, Jason Kirchie, we were sitting around the campfire with him one evening. He said, "Well, why don't you just do it?" He's an entrepreneur. He's been an entrepreneur his whole life, and and while I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur, uh, I've always worked for the man and been constantly disappointed <laughs> <laughs> uh, with the carrots that get dangled and jerked away. And and so um, he says, well, "Why don't you just go for it?" And at that point, we came back and said, all right, let's do this. Because worst case, we can go and spend, you know, six months living full time, YouTube and full time. And if it doesn't work out, so what? Like we come back having had an amazing adventure mm-hmm. and having some incredible content um, that we can watch for the rest of our lives. And we'll go back to work. Like, yeah. you know, we've got the skill set and mm-hmm. we, we can just go back to work if we have to. I think that's a good way of looking at it, too. Um, my wife and I, for most of 2018 and beginning of 2019, before I went to go hike the Appalachian Trail, we were traveling full time um, in our Forerunner and uh, our Pod 180. And the thing that always held me back was the concept of, oh, my gosh, I'm leaving my job. This is so scary to be able to be out here full time doing this. You know, how am I going to support myself? This is all going to fall apart. What if this goes wrong? What if that goes wrong? But I think the approach that you guys took is a much healthier way of looking at it, where it's, we're going to give this a try because we have an opportunity to do it. And it's because it's something that we want to do. And if it doesn't work out, we can always go back to working in six months if that's the case. So it sounds like it wasn't a difficult or scary decision for you guys. No, no. I don't know that it was, wasn't scary. I think it was, I mean, we definitely are planners by nature. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Kev was like, okay, I've looked at our finances and it looks like if we traveled this much, we'd be able to go back to Tennessee or wherever we wanted to. We could rent something. I'll go back to work. We'll save up again. Then we could buy a house, you know, go back to normal, whatever. And so uh, it it wasn't a willy nilly flippant decision, but, you know, at the same time, uh, you know, knowing that we had that little nest egg to fall back on made it much easier to say yes to. Absolutely. And, and like she's saying, it wasn't without its fears because, you know, living in a tent full time with your family is scary enough. You know, the concept, honestly, you know, like, how is that going to work on a day to day basis? And... I don't like camping in the rain. <laughs> right. So every I mean, time it, it rains, are we going to get a hotel yeah, or am I going to have to learn to deal with it? storms <laughs> and things like that. So, like, there, there was definitely some, some fear factor, but from a financial standpoint, um, we'd already come so far in our transition from paycheck to paycheck to being much more comfortable because we, we had lived in a, in a fifth wheel camper for three Three years years. at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can imagine, um, and, and a lot of that, a lot of that frame was actually on someone's ranch who 
basically had an RV spot, and all we were paying for was electrical. That was it. So we had just been socking away, a, a, you know, a nice nest egg. Mm-hmm. And then when we decided to go full time, my truck was paid off, and we owned the camper outright. So once we sold those, we said, "All right, here's here's our travel egg. This is our capital investment right here. Yeah. We'll keep tabs on this, and you know, if it begins to dip below this." point then we'll we'll jettison this plan and go back to work and we headed off to alaska and started sharing our stories and lo and behold the ship did not sink it's now now granted we're not we're not on on top of it by any means no. but like we're still going forward and and we've developed a lot of different income streams and things like that that keep the dream alive but uh yeah it it was it was scary in its own way at first but um, having, having a lot of preparation ahead of that, uh, made it much more easier to digest. Alaska was literally day one. Like, is that where you went on, you know, as of today, we are full time and day one out the door heading to Alaska. It wasn't as, uh, climatic as that. (laughs) Yeah. We had so much like, oh, we need to take our belongings back to New Mexico and then we're going to go to Tennessee for this. And then we need to go back for the, like we hopped around for such a long time in the lower 48 that we at one point I was like, if we don't go, I'm done. I'm tired of sleeping at someone else's house or camping at a random campground. Like let's, Uh, let's go or not go. And that goes back to us being planners and stuff. And so, you know, looking back the forerunner and the turtle back, we could have jumped in it and left that day. I mean, we really could have, Yeah. but you know, there were a list of things that I wanted to get done so that we could have, you know, the best organization, like the storage system that we built that went in the forerunner, like I'm glad we invested in the time that it took to design and, and install that, that yeah. because it really made life a lot simpler. Um, but yeah, it drug on for quite some time. Then we're like, oh, well, let's go back and see our family because we had some family members that weren't in the best of health. So we had, we went back to Tennessee and we hung out with them. So it, <laughs> we, we were definitely, uh, yeah, it wasn't this, all like, right, hit the trail. No, it, wasn't. it was <laughs> a lot of preparation and time before yeah. we finally finally got to take off. But uh, the day that we finally did, when we headed north from Phoenix to the Grand Canyon, yeah, and we camped on the south side of the Grand Canyon in the National Forest there, and it was just like, <sighs> uh, yeah, yeah, finally, this, we're finally we going were on our way, yeah. and that's that's kind of where it was like. Oh, what did we just? What, what have do? we done? <laughs> <laughs> Are we sure we really want to do this? <laughs> yeah. And then when we get to Canada, when we get to our first border crossing, <laughs> yeah, we're like, oh, we're okay. Here we go. This is for real now. No turning back after this. <laughs> That's it. Whole new country. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you had the Forerunner as your rig, and you said the 2018 Turtleback trailer as well. Yeah. At, at that point in time, yeah. That was our second turtle back at that point. Did you build them out or like modify them to a huge extent on your end before you traveled out? So the beauty of the, the second turtle back, um, you know, like I said, I, I worked for them as their ops manager for about eight months. And so we were in the process of doing a lot of redesign. So all the lessons learned and preferences that I developed from our first turtle back, I was luckily able to incorporate 80% of that into the new design. Mm-hmm. And so... To answer your so question, really was. yes, in a way, <laughs> <laughs> I did modify it for my adventure, uh, but also hundreds of other people out there too. So it's, it's, it's got a special place in our heart just because it's got a little bit of my fingerprint um, on, on top of that incredible footprint. So uh, yeah, it's it's been a it's it's been game changing for us since day one. Mm-hmm. So then, being honest, I'm personally not a huge vehicle guy um sometimes i have to think twice about how you can properly jump start a dead battery <laughs> <laughs> and um there were always times where we were going off-roading in the past or when we were traveling last year in the rv where there'd be something rattling or we'd have an engine issue and to me personally i saw it as like having to rebuild the space shuttle i mean i got better with time but i've always struggled with engines and understanding vehicles is there any advice you can give on some of the main things people should know about vehicle maintenance um, or vehicle modification before they would hit the road to go over landing? Maybe not even in a full time capacity like you guys, but, you know, just for weekend over landing, for example. You know, we've always been big advocates of of people working on their own vehicles. Um, I know it's intimidating, you know, at the beginning, 
But what I would highly recommend is get involved with the local group, you know, find some people who are um, car guys, basically, and Mm -hmm. say, hey, I want to change my oil this weekend. Can you come watch me? You know, like I've watched the YouTube videos, blah, blah, blah. But can you give me a bit of a, a bit of assurance that I'm taking the right steps and start with those small little things? You know, when you're it's amazing when you're crawling under there and and looking at your vehicle, changing the oil, just doing basic maintenance, you start to develop a familiarity with the way things are supposed to look. So, for example, if, if you're out on the trail and you do hear a weird sound and, and you pop the hood and you're like, hmm, I think I'm missing a belt, you know, like it's it's amazing what what that could do for for you in that particular situation. Knowing when you can continue, it's a minor issue and knowing when uh, we better stop and call for help. Mm-hmm. That could be, mean the difference of blowing your engine or putting your family in danger, you know, if you've got a brake cylinder that's leaking or something like that. So. Um, baby steps and work with someone who, who knows what they're doing, you know, develop those relationships. And, you know, that's really where, where it starts. Um, You're probably not going to become a master mechanic, you know, but just being familiar with your vehicle and the way it's supposed to look is really important. On a typical day, who's your primary driver? Me. 100%. (laughs) (laughs) So why, how did you guys uh, come to the decision? Sarah is the primary driver here. Well, that's when Kevin decided he wanted to start filming every camping trip we went on. And he'd be like, okay, now you jump out and film this. And I'm like, okay, where do you want me to stand? He's like, well, stand, stand over there. I'm like, and he's like, but as you're standing there, make sure you hold the camera like this and make sure it's in frame so that the car looks like it's going like this over this obstacle. And I was like, wait a minute, I'm going to drive. You can jump out and do your filming because I was like, I, I mean, it's not my favorite thing to be told what to do 100% of the time. And I can't read his mind. So instead of doing it two times, we could do it once and, and I'll drive. And, <laughs> and even honestly, at the time, like I didn't particularly like driving either because I didn't know what I was doing. I'd never really driven off road. And uh, so he was like, well, I'll just, I'll just coach you through it and you'll be fine. I'm like, okay, that's fine. So from then on, I'm, I'm the driver now. Yeah, so it was born out of out of necessity, but I tell you what, she is just a freaking amazing driver. She really has the right touch, and uh, we've never broken anything. And it, we also have the ability to to spot through difficult obstacles. Like she understands what I need from her when it comes to tire direction and and momentum and things like that. So um, I was really impressed, honestly, how quickly. Uh, we developed a level of communication because you also have to remember that I'm holding a camera while spotting someone through a, you know difficult terrain. So, so sometimes it turns up being like a head nod to the right, well, and, head and generally nod to the it's, left, or, it's generally my head's going up and down like when yes she's heading the right no. way. <laughs> and then if I need her to go another direction, I'm just gently tilting my head the other direction because I don't want to shake the camera too much. And it's just... It's like I'm driving with my head nods. I mean, she truly understands what I need. I'm a great <laughs> robot. <laughs> I can get the job done when told what to do. Yeah. Only to with where driving, now but... when somebody else is trying to like, uh, what's it called? Marshall? Marshalling? Marshalling. When someone's yeah. trying to marshal me through an obstacle, I'm like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> Where's Kevin? Yeah, you can <laughs> or just s- let me do it by myself. I'm, yeah. I'll be good. Yeah, it, it really is. It really is like a language, honestly. And, and you know, the more you will with very specific people, the more you learn what they mean by, you know, a little tick of the hand versus a wild waving of the arms and, yeah. and stuff like that. And so, yeah, it is funny when you try and do that with someone else. <laughs> So main gear that you guys are using in a typical day, um, I guess, what's, uh, what are you using like for vehicle care in a typical day or checking your vehicle diagnostics? Um, so we started out early with uh, an app called Torque Pro. And so basically all modern vehicles from like 96 and, and up have what's called an OBD2 port. And so there's this little Bluetooth reader that pops in to that port and it's what you know the dealership would typically use to run diagnostics with and uh you plug that in it connects to the app and you can watch a whole lot more uh, telemetry than what's just on your 
your dashboard of your vehicle. And so we would primarily use that to watch our transmission temperatures, especially if we're going through mountain passes and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Um, and then there was also a code check. So you could run a, a system check to see if there's any codes being popped up on the vehicle. And so um, that would become not not necessarily a daily evolution, but it, at least uh, uh, every two or three days, just run Return that, on, run that check it. real quick and see, see what's going on on, on the engine itself. And um, it, it definitely came in handy a few times, but uh, that would be the first thing. And then every time we would air down and air back up, you know, while you're airing up, that was when I was really checking the tires, you know, making sure that there hadn't been any sneaky gashes that, that got put in the sidewalls and stuff that could lead to a blowout somewhere down the road. Um, and then I also carry a thermometer, uh, a laser thermometer, so I could actually crawl under, check the differentials in the vehicle, check the bearings on, on the trailer after we've been on the road for a while. And so that would just kind of give us a baseline to see how everything was, was taken, you know, the, the punishment and abuse and stuff, because we were heavy, you know, like combined when we were traveling to, to Alaska and back with the trailer and forerunner combined, we were at 10,000 pounds with everybody inside. That was, you know, gross vehicle weight with all the liquids and stuff topped off. And uh, so, yeah, it was important to keep a, keep a check on that. Now, we did drive much slower because we didn't have to be anywhere at any particular time. That's so, true. you know, we would drive 60, 65 miles an hour um, just to try and cut down on fuel consumption and take care of everything. Yeah. So. Nice. What are you using for uh, navigation out there? Uh, so primarily using Gaia GPS. Um, and we have a few other things that we use from time to time, but Gaia has been just the lifeblood as far as um, planning out the next you know, three, 400 miles as we were trucking through Canada and Alaska, we would try and hit a, a Starbucks or a coffee shop or a totem pole or <laughs> a, a <Tim laughs> whatever, <Hortons. laughs> what, whatever there was on the way up there, you know, um, and it, which obviously got progressively worse as we went, but, uh, we would try and grab a, you know, significant, uh, portion of, um, topographical maps and things like that as we were as we were hitting new areas of Canada and Alaska. Yeah. What about entertainment and shelter? Um, and the reason I definitely asked the entertainment question is because of uh, your, your kid, Caroline. Um, what are we doing to mm-hmm. keep her entertained while traveling? Uh, well, something that uh, I did before we started traveling was, you know, we were looking at the trailer and, and what we were able to bring in. At the time, she was going into kindergarten. And so I was like, well, you know, when we finish this, you know, I don't want her starting kindergarten late, per se. Uh, and so I had decided that I was like, I'll, I'm going to homeschool one. So I picked a curriculum and it came with all kinds of little thing activities and things for her to do. But uh, then I was like, OK. I gave her a little tote box, not the shoe box size, but a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger than that. And at four years old, I looked at her and I said, Caroline, here is your toy box. You pick whatever you want to go in this toy box. And if it closes with the lid on, it comes with you. And whatever doesn't, we're packing away. And the reason I gave her that responsibility was because (laughs) she is that type of child that if I had picked out what I thought she would have wanted, she'd be like... Mom, that's not what I wanted to play with. <laughs> so I was like, you know what? You're four. That's right. You know what you like. You're going to pick it out. That's right. And so she, that was all she had was that. And then like the school stuff that I had. But um, something I started doing along the way was um, usually we would travel five to seven days at a time and then try and find a big town for laundry, groceries and stuff like that. And so a a part of what I would do is I created what I called an activity bag for her. And it was usually just a little cloth, um, like little shoulder bag. And I would go to the dollar section or to the dollar general dollar tree. And I would pick out a new coloring book, a new sticker pad, um, new pencils or markers, a new little $1 toy or something. And it would always be like a surprise for her that when she happened to say she was bored, I'd be like, well, why don't you find something to do in your activity bag, you know, kind of thing. And so that really, really helped her maintain like, you know, when she because we didn't want her on the iPad the entire time. Yeah. Like the point was, is that we were supposed to be enjoying nature together, you yeah. know, like look out the window, be bored. That's fine. Um, but definitely having 
uh, a change in the activity bag, like the contents inside every few weeks really helped keep her entertained yeah. on the road. And there came a point where the, uh, the tablet actually went into, uh, Remission. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it went into storage at that point. It um, did for like a long time. Yeah. And, and honestly, that was when we definitely saw her biggest development in creativity. I mean, mm-hmm. just sitting in the car seat, looking out the window, singing songs that oh she was gosh. making up. Yeah. I mean, and like, okay, that's some that's, pretty that's legit lyrics bad. you got mm-hmm. going there. Like, that's not, yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's definitely a balance that comes with it. Um, I think, and we've talked about this before in several different podcasts is how we get caught up in this idea that kids have to be constantly entertained and that it's our job to entertain them. Yeah. And, and that's, that's it. And Uh -uh. that's not, that's not true. I mean, you have to be willing to let them be bored. And honestly, it's probably more punishment on the parents than it is the kid, (laughs) but in in the beginning, while you're training them, it is, but it's absolutely critical to their development and finding ways to, to be creative. And, um, just even as adults, you know, we find ourselves feeling the need to be constantly entertained. And I think we're all seeing, especially right now in this time of lockdown and quarantine, that it's a great time to look at ourselves and where we've come from and where we're going and, and be creative about what's next. And so I think starting that process as a, at an early age is, is crucial. I'm glad you brought that up about the lockdown because I did want to get to that. Um, you know, how have you guys been doing with the coronavirus pandemic? I know it's, it's a really fluid situation and there's things changing every week. I mean, just between when we do this conversation and when we're actually putting the episode out, I'm sure there's going to be even more developments, but I'm curious, how have you guys dealt with it? Uh, it's not, it's not been my favorite thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. at the time now I'm starting to get really tired sitting here for, you know, over a month, but yes. Yeah. We're going on, deal. we're in week five and a half, I almost so. six. Yeah. 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 Uh, and so the reason we're in Hobbs is Kevin had taken a part-time job uh, as a contractor. And so we decided we'd put Caroline in school and give her that opportunity to get a flavor for that. And I went back to school. So, uh, school, I'm homeschooling again and doing my school from home and Kevin's working from home. So we go on a lot of walks (laughs) and, you know, sometimes it's, Hey, you go in your room. Dad's going to be in the office. I'm going to be in our room. Yeah. Like nobody come out for 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> Everyone's but... social distance now. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> we just need a 20 minute social distance. Okay. Uh, but really overall, like initially it may have been a little more challenging. Caroline was in heaven. Like she loves to hang out with us. You know, it wasn't really until like almost week three or four that she was like, what? when am I going back to school? And we're like, not never. Sorry. <laughs> they, they closed school, you know? Yeah. Um, but it really wasn't, I don't think until like the last couple of weeks that we're kind of like, we miss our friends. Yeah. <laughs> we want to go camping. We like, we can walk around outside, but we don't, we don't do much else. <laughs> and we were talking about this, like, you know, it would be one thing if someone said, Hey, how would you like to spend a whole month at home just doing your thing, catching up on random stuff? Like, how would you like that? We'd be like, Oh, this oh, sounds, that great. sounds great. But when someone says, By the way, you can't go anywhere else and you can't do anything else, then it, what went from this cool concept now it's like, Wait a minute, you're telling me I can't do something? Well, and, and the so, fact that everything is closed too, I and, think. Right. And you're so you're kind of like, oh, I really can't do anything. So, I have to cook at home all the time. Right. So, so <laughs> it's a monkey's paw. <laughs> yes. So subconsciously, like you've got that on your back going, okay, yeah, this initially it was, it was good. And, and we got to catch up on a lot of things and, and well, you know, we're outside watching the butterflies and the grass and the wind. And now it's like, okay, we're ready to go do something else. Yeah. But it's been good. Um, personally for me, I've had just a ton of, um, backlog articles and videos and reviews and and things like that, that I've wanted to, wanted to catch up on. And so it's given me an excellent opportunity to do that. As a matter of fact, I'm working on a new Gaia GPS features video. The one I did 
was like, it's like two years old now and yeah. you guys have made a lot of progress since we did that. So I'll be coming out with that and I'm just getting emails on a daily basis of, well, how do you do this in Gaia and how do you do that in Gaia? And I was like, don't worry, I got a whole series that I'll be working on. And so this has given me an opportunity to do that for a lot of different products and stuff. And so, um, well, another thing that's been interesting too, is that with, uh, everyone staying at home, we're getting a whole new slew of people watching us that, you know, are emailing us, asking us questions and stuff like that, that we're like, we've, we've already answered these before, but then realizing, oh, this is somebody brand new, yeah. you know, who's binging from the beginning to where we are now kind of situation. So um, that's been pretty cool. Like on our premiere nights on Thursday nights, you know, getting brand new people coming in and joining yeah. the chat and watching the videos and asking us questions. So um, I think that's been an interesting aspect to, to our lifestyle overland business as a whole. Yeah. And it, the emails and stuff that have been coming in, like I got one yesterday from a guy, um, he's actually in the Netherlands and he didn't go into detail, but it sounds like he's dealing with some significant health issues. And um, he said, you know, basically these videos are what's keeping him going right now. You know, he's not able to get out and enjoy the outdoors and stuff. And so being able to, to watch our episodes and, and get a new episode every Thursday and stuff is, you know, is what's been keeping him positive. So I want to go back actually to talk real quick about two trips you guys specifically done have done um, because they were just fascinating to follow. The first one I wanted to talk about was the Enchanted Rockies Trail. Can you tell us a little bit about that trail, that trip you went on? So the Enchanted Rockies Trail, you know, like I mentioned before, it was just, it, it was a, a step towards um, wanting to develop something that kind of had our own fingerprint on like we wanted we, we'd seen like there's, there's a there's a trail called the shadow of the rockies which is an extension of the trans-american trail um and so we kind of eyeballed that a bit but that's more dual sport uh motorcycle mm -hmm. uh, type trails and so i was like well shoot why don't i just sit down there's thousands of trails in new mexico and colorado and see if i can't come up with a cool little you know route and and develop it and then go and confirm it and so that whole evolution was, it was very educational. I learned, learned a lot about, uh, using different, using the mapping software, you know, I was using guide GPS as my primary route planning. I think that's when you guys just activated the snap to route. So it was like, I wasn't having to go click, 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 click. I was able to just <laughs> click along click. the trail and it would auto route and stuff. And so that, that was extremely useful. Um, and then, I would use the satellite layers and stuff to really zoom in and confirm, you know, if the road was there. Cause that is, that is a problem sometimes in New Mexico is a lot of the mapping software, uh, or I should say the the map sources may not match up with what's actually in the, in the field due to forest fires and floods. And, you know, things are constantly changing, especially out here in the West with, um, just the crazy weather that, that can sometimes affect the terrain. And so that was really a cool learning experience and we, we found some dead ends that weren't going to work and we would reroute around it and update the track. And so that was, uh, it was really amazing. And like I said, we did it for us. You know, we did it because it was something that we wanted to challenge ourselves to do. And little did we know that it was the spark that was going to ignite the whole YouTube thing. And so, um, yeah, I think cause you have us, a, you have a full chronicle of that on your YouTube channel, right? Yeah, yeah, there's a five-part series on on the trail itself. So the whole thing, um, the whole Enchanted Rockies Trail is a self-created route by you guys, right? That's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. How long is it? Uh, I think it's, if I remember right, it's 1,200 miles, and I think about 740 of it is actually off pavement, if, mm -hmm. I, if I remember correctly, yeah. How long did it take you to uh, complete the whole thing? Uh, Travel-wise, we... we leisurely took 10 days yeah, uh like you could probably days. we've had some friends who've done it in about five days and you know that's that's moving pretty, pretty fast quick. yeah um it's subject to weather though if there's there's trails and, and we've done some recent videos where we've gone back to some of these sections and when if you get a half inch of rain trails that are just a yawn turn into, oh, I need max tracks and I need my winch and I need <laughs> mud tires. And mm -hmm. so it can escalate quickly. And uh, there's definitely in the shoulder season. So, you know, spring and fall, 
you could see snow in these passes that that could definitely change the route. So it's a challenge. You know, you really have to try and hit it just right. Uh, but the beauty of it is, and this is by design, there are plenty of highways that you can hit to bypass. So mm -hmm. it's great for families uh, who either don't want to do technical sections or maybe they hit some bad weather or there's Somebody a trail shut down. Or, there was a yeah. lot of forest fires uh, a few years ago. So there, there was a lot of options for people to bypass that. And so that's why it's such a, it's a good starter trail, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And then there was another one I think you recently talked about, the North Country Loop, right? Yeah. So that's not so much a trail as it is just the route that we, that we chose to take up to Tuck Tuck Tuck. I mean, there's nothing really special about that. The thing about the, about being up North is there's not, surprisingly, there's not a lot of off-road trails. And really? That, yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that really blew our mind that we were thinking, oh yeah, Alaska and Canada, like can't wait to get up there and like have all kinds of trails. Well, the problem is, is that terrain, you know, a lot of that is tundra and to build a road that can hold the weight of a vehicle takes a significant amount of effort. And so the only time that you start seeing roads heading off into the wilderness is because there's a mine or, or a small community or, yeah. or something like that. So if, if you were to really sit down and, and study this, you would see that really, as far as Alaska is concerned, only about a quarter to a third of it is accessible by road. The rest of it is by boat or float plane. Wow. Or, yeah, in, or in the no winter idea. on the snow yeah. machines. Yeah. Now, if you come back a little bit further south, you get into British Columbia. And let me tell you what, that is trail mecca. Like, I cannot wait yeah. to get back to British Columbia because that's logging country and there are roads everywhere. Is that, would you, would you say that's your favorite place to be doing off-roading? Um, or do you have like a specific special go-to spot? You know, that's always a tough Ooh, that's thing. That's tough. Um, so, you know, trying to determine your favorite place is difficult. You know, I, I really enjoyed the North Country trip just because it was more long distance. You know, there was a lot of pavement involved. You know, that, that was, um, and even, even like the Denali Highway and the Dempster Highway uh, is more of a, a groomed track than what I would traditionally would like to, to travel on. Yeah, but I think the aspect of it, of it feeling so wild still yeah. made it feel acceptable to still call overlanding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, obviously we're not after bragging rights or anything, but yeah, as far as like each, each adventure comes with its own, um, pros and cons, you know, like the, the remoteness of going to Tuk 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 and going to dead horse, like there's only a few people that have done that. And to see that with your own eyes, you know, to, to meet the people of, of Tuck and, I mean, like I still occasionally text with John, the guy who showed us around the town. I mean, that's, that's incredible. That's so cool to me, you know, to have a connection there and, um, to go to, to dead horse. And the coolest part for that was like seeing the musk ox, you know, like, mm -hmm. what is this hippie Buffalo? I mean, yeah. this thing is wild, you know? And, um, so, you know, each one kind of has its own highlight and, you know, we were, we were actually up late last night recording a, a, podcast of our own. That's kind of why we look a little disheveled right now, but <laughs> nah, it's all we right. were talking about, <laughs> we were talking about Death Valley and, uh, how it's become this really special place to us because of not necessarily good things. I mean, right. we, we, we have even, some gnarly stories. We've endured some, uh, 80 mile an hour wind gust and, you know, almost getting, having our tent collapse and like all these crazy things that happened in Death Valley where at the time it was miserable, but now it's like, Oh, those stories are so cool. Like I can't wait to go back to death Valley and, and we've developed a love relationship because of the hot springs and just the different trails and the, um, the different geographical oddities or geological oddities that are, that are in death Valley. And so, um, to say this one's my favorite is very difficult. I can, I can easier, it's easier for me to say, these are some of my favorite highlights, but I don't want to speak for Sarah. So you, I mean, what are your thoughts? Like, what's your favorite? areas that we've traveled. I mean, I, I would definitely agree with what you said. Like, I don't know if I could pick one. Like when I've been presented the question, like, did you like the Dempster highway or did you like the, uh, what's the one in 
The Dalton Highway. The Dalton Highway. I liked the Dempster Highway better. Mm -hmm. You know, like, so if I'm presented with it, did you like this or this better? I can answer that a little more easily. But if you're like, what is your favorite place to go? I'd be like, I don't really know. (laughs) I like, like, there's parts about it that I've, I've enjoyed every aspect of it, but, um, well, I think I think the trails in uh, Southern Colorado, yeah, hold I would a special part in, in Northern too. New Mexico, yeah. have are definitely some of my favorites. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What advice might you have for people wanting to start getting into overlanding or get more experience? Um, would you recommend like how? First of all, how would you find like local trails in your area, or would it even be best to start local? First piece of advice is keep it achievable. Yeah. Keep it local. Especially if you're doing it with your family. Yeah. So, you know, look and see what's what's nearby. Um, if you've got national forests, those are great places to start looking. Um, we'll highly recommend getting plugged in with a local group that um, can take you out there. Uh, you don't have to have all the gear. You don't have to have it all figured out. But if you have a good group of people that you trust and, and who have those pieces and parts, um, that's going to jumpstart you. In, into getting out there more often. And so um, a good resource for that is overlandbound.com. You know, the, their community has been just phenomenal as far as receiving people who are new to this mm-hmm. and plugging them into local groups and stuff that go out on a, on a weekly basis or a biweekly basis. And that's really, that's really the best way to get started. Um, but we always encourage people don't get overwhelmed because this is a very gear heavy um uh, hobby and pastime and mm-hmm. you can quickly get just flooded. In, like, in, uh, oh, with, well I can't go cause I don't have a winch. No, right. you, yeah. you could still go. You just yeah. need to pick what's achievable for your vehicle. That's it. And, and even like watching our channel, people, you, you might get overwhelmed seeing, you know, the trailer and, and the roof rack and the bumpers and all that stuff. And you don't need it. Like I said, you know, we, the day after we bought our forerunner, we were out there, you know, <laughs> yeah. and that's, that's the main thing is, is having a, a reliable four wheel drive vehicle and good tires. If you have that, you have 85% of what mm-hmm. you need. The rest of it can come as you go, like go to Walmart, get you a dome tent, get you an air mattress. Like you can start really, really small and go out on a weekend, have a great time. And then as you go, the next piece of gear that you need most will identify itself. Right. You know, it's, it's really a self-revealing process. So, uh, the main thing is to get out there. Don't wait until you got everything. You just got to start, start getting out there. Um, but I would stress safety is, is always number one. So things like a first aid kit, fire extinguishers, um, we use a, you know, like emergency communication device. So having something that you can text via satellite is, is really important to let family members know where you are, whether you're good or not. Um, things like a, a PLB, so a personal locator beacon that you can um, activate if you needed to call to Calvary. Like those are probably some of the first things that you need to need to think about for your kit. So I don't want to, I don't want to say just get out there. I want to say, Get out there, but, but at least have a few of these pieces <laughs> yeah. before you before you go. So, um, and then as far as finding trails, I mean, uh, this sounds like a terrible plug, but <laughs> if download the Gaia GPS app and get on there, and and there's several different layers that are going to give you um, the information you're looking for. So whether that's national forest or national parks or things like that just spend some time in the app just you know like rather than flipping through instagram grab the app and zoom into these areas that are that are nearby and and just start getting familiar that i mean that's how we stumbled on linking up these trails to make the enchanted rockies trail and you never know you might go whoa this is cool this ties to that and that to that and before you know you've got your own little loop so staying consistent in your uh, curiosity and just, just researching things and, and you never know what you might stumble on. Quick wrap up. Want to fire three quick questions to you. Um, number one, what is your favorite camp food? Oh, uh, what's, I think I know what yours is going to be. Okay. You guess mine then. Uh, yours is going to be the camp crystals. Yeah. Recently the, the or, little sliders that we made, that's pretty high up or there. Or the carne asada. Carne asada would be my favorite. Yeah. yeah so steak tacos. That's that's probably my absolute favorite. <laughs> uh, what's yours? I think mine is going to be breakfast. 
I love like bacon and eggs and toast and coffee. What about our, our newest dish that we're getting ready to share that we had this morning? Oh, uh, chorizo gravy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. And it's so, and it's the easiest thing to make, but yeah. it tastes so decadent. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Nice, nice. Question two: What is the worst or craziest scenario you've ever gotten into? You know, the worst or craziest scenario. Worst or craziest. You know, we're pretty we're we're pretty cautious about what we do, so we we haven't gotten into a lot of significantly dangerous situations. I would say probably the the most challenging by far was rescuing the that Dodge Ram 2500 with a full on Lance Camper on the back from the swamp alongside the Dempster Highway. Yeah. Uh they were looking at staying there for 3 days and then probably paying $3,000 to have a, a a big enough truck come out of Whitehorse to rescue them. And so we're like, well, <laughs> let's see what we can Kev do. Kevin's like, let me see what I can do <laughs> um, with our tiny little forerunner. <laughs> so we were we were well outweighed when it came to our ratings and stuff. And so we had to we we had to come up with a plan to get this massive vehicle unstuck. And we're talking, you know, it, it was it was probably eighteen inches down yeah, to in this knees. tundra, and it was it was an incredible evolution to get them rescued. So I would say that's probably the craziest situation that that we've been in by far. Yeah. Number three, if you could be anywhere right now with your rig, where would it be? I would say right now, boy, that is difficult. I I, know mine. Okay, go. I I would want to be in the Yukon territories. You know, I think that was my favorite. You know what? I I think I would agree with that to go back up in the Yukon and Northern BC and Mm -hmm. just explore around that area. Yeah, yeah, I loved it up there. Yeah, the air was so fresh and so clean, and yeah, I, I would, I would modify that if we're talking. And I'd go get a cinnamon roll again. <laughs> oh gosh, <laughs> those were amazing. It'd be worth the drive just for that cinnamon roll. Yeah, I, I would say for me personally, northern New Mexico or southern Colorado right now, with the weather the way it is, that would be where I want to be. I am making a yeah. side note though: Yukon Territory best cinnamon rolls. Just remembering that for future reference. They're sourdough. This lady makes them out of sourdough. Yeah. 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 And they were like, I kept seeing this sign as we were driving along. It's like, best cinnamon rolls in the world. Two miles later, you're almost close to the best cinnamon rolls in the world. I'm like, Kev, I really think that's a, like, we should try this. And he's like, well, this is your trip too. If you want cinnamon rolls, you can do that. I'm like, okay. (laughs) And it was, we got the best cinnamon roll. We got a loaf of bread and we got bacon. And coffee was banging oh, yeah. good. It yeah. was so delicious. But anyhow, yeah, yeah. we're hungry now. <laughs> I'm very food oriented. <laughs> That's good. We don't really travel. We don't really travel. We just like eating really good food in random places. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I'm the same way. It's mm-hmm. like my favorite part of traveling is the different foods you can eat in Me different too. places. So it's awesome. That's it. That's Absolutely. It. Absolutely. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Kevin and Sarah, for joining us. Your background, your stories are so cool. It's so awesome you guys have been able to live your dream and make your hobby both your living and your lifestyle. It's a great inspiration, I know, for me, but I think I can speak for all of us when we say it's a great inspiration for all of us. It's awesome. Thank you. We appreciate you having us. Thank you, Kevin and Sarah, for a great talk. We wish you, and of course, Caroline, the best in all of your travels. You can learn more about Overlanding by following Lifestyle Overland on their YouTube channel and their Instagram accounts, at Lifestyle Overland, as well as at Mrs. Lifestyle Overland. And also, of course, their website, www.lifestyleoverland.com, where you can tune into their own new podcast, Campfire Confessions. Make sure to check out our show notes for quick and easy links to their pages by going to blog.gaiagps.com and then look for the podcast link in the upper right corner. And while you're there... Make sure to check out our previous episodes with backcountry experts Daniel White, who's the Black Alachian, Andrew Skirka, Heather Anderson, and the Real Hiking Viking. In our next show, we're going to catch up with Adventure Allen to tell us his reason to keep hiking. Famous for his wild storytelling, Adventure Allen Dixon takes us through his five decades of backpacking, the deeper meaning of getting outside, his favorite high routes, and what typically blocks people from going ultra light in backpacking. You won't want to miss this episode with backpacking expert, famed gear reviewer, and host of AdventureAllen.com. Finally, before you go, don't forget to tap into the Gaia GPS discount. 
subscribe to our show, The Out and Back Podcast, and then grab a discount on the best backcountry navigation app by going to GaiaGPS.com slash podcast. Until next time, I'm Shanti, and we'll see you again in a couple weeks on the Out and Back podcast presented by Gaia GPS. Have a good one.